everybody. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, uh, Peter Childs, uh, Professor Peter Childs. Um, so um, Peter has held numerous um, academic positions. He's uh, founded technology startups. He's led uh, innovation initiatives, uh, both here at the University of Sussex and now at Imperial College London. Um, one of his more challenging roles was supervising me many years ago during my PhD, um, a time which I look back on very fondly. Mm -hmm. um, so I know we're in good hands tonight. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Peter as he uh, shares his insights with us. So I was asked, good evening everybody and thank you for turning out. Uh, this is a delight to be here in Sussex. I spent 24 years here as a um, boy and student and uh, ultimately professor. I had 23 amazing years here. The last year was not the bad year, but I did have one wobble bad year amongst those 24. Um, but it's an amazing time. But this is a talk on cobotics, so I thought I would put up one slide right at the start. This is not a propeller, okay? So you, you're not looking at a... Uh, a, a Merlin engine powering a, a, a propeller, not at all. This is a very big turbine, so the photo is very misleading. I did show it to a former director of Rolls-Royce, and he said, I asked him, what are you looking at? And he said, a little bug on a, on a, on a propeller blade. And I said, yeah, wrong scale, this is an 80-metre 80, 80 turbine blade. <laughs> so um, uh, my heritage here at Sussex, I spent 21 years in the Thermofluid Mechanics Research Centre, which still exists, delightfully. They're doing very different and new things. And when I was at Sussex, I spent time working on much smaller blades, actually compressor blades, so 30 millimetres long. Um, and we're still playing around with turbine machinery. And uh, odd things here, but you know, what is that proboscis coming out of this, um, this hex pod robot? Well, um, it's, it's just uh, ultrasonic scanning, so doing non-destructive testing, detecting whether the blade has got good integrity or not. You, there's meant to be lots of glue on these blades. But when you're gluing up something with several hundred metres of, of glue, you know, is it where you expect it to be? Did the job get done? Did it get refilled? And also, uh, these blades flex a lot, so stuff disappears. Have you, um, uh, you're looking at batteries for retrofitting homes to improve um, Home, uh, home energy solutions. Many of us will have put or asked for double glazing, triple glazing to be installed. And it's great for the first six months, isn't it? And then you put your hand near the casement and you go, where's that draft coming from? And those of you who are astute know that polyurethane is hopeless in UV. So a pinprick um, or a hole just means that your, your um, casement will gradually get um, uh, many centimetres of air ingress around the surroundings. Uh, you're using the wrong material in the wrong place in that case. All right, so I, that, that was just to kick you off. So what I was meant to talk about cobotics before we got there. And then um, my agenda, I will do a little bit of context, which for a professor means boasting about themselves, so we'll do some of that. And then I'll get on to some videos of cobotics today. It's a big thing. It's a big thing in the UK, it's a big thing worldwide, so we'll get on to that. Then, talking about cobotics, collaborative robotics in wind applications, we've got a flavour of that. Then in retrofit for your home and my home. And then competencies. I was speaking to a former executive from one of the national health um, uh, regions this, this evening, just a few minutes ago, and we were saying, well, you know, as managers, do we even know how to manage? And we had quite a lot to say about that to each other. And I found throughout my life I've had to reskill in terms of competencies. And I keep on discovering I'm totally incompetent and need to. Um, this is being recorded, probably is, but let's do it for the recording. Um, you know, sometimes I have to say to people, I've upped my skills. Up. You can see what's coming next. And you know, do we need to be polite when we have incompetent management? Management needs to have high levels of competence. Okay, well, thank you. And then, yeah, boasting about yourself, well, uh, 
I've been around for a long time. I didn't lose my hair recently. I arrived at Sussex University looking like this as a 20-year-old. And uh, I left looking like this. But I had the delight of working with a lot of organisations around the world and picked up lots of titles and had lots of fun. I've always done the academic thing alongside business. So uh, when I was 14, I ran a record business in a, um, in a market in London and used to make well, I used to make a thousand pound profit weekend. And it was delightful as a young teenager to do something like that. Then ran a knitwear business, a shirt business, a jewellery business, a decision-making software company, all sorts of things. But I've also done the academic thing, so I've always uh, probably got bored quickly and wanted to do other things. In I'm currently working at a very nice university. This was a fantastic university. I loved my time here. I then moved to Imperial. And uh, sometimes people ask me why. And here I had about 24 colleagues doing engineering. And uh, I was invited up to Imperial as an external examiner, actually to the Royal College of Art, and just met a thousand engineers. And I just thought, yeah, it was a funny weekend. Yeah, it was a Friday to a Monday. Um, uh, Friday I was invited up, Monday I was interviewed. And um, it, it was just a... a, a, a that excitement of having a thousand colleagues that you could talk engineering to. And I found that hugely um, beneficial to me and the way I operate anyway. But uh, that doesn't stop my heritage here. Managed to persuade a uh, gentleman that you'll see named somewhere on this slide um, to donate a very big sum. You know, it's nice to win, I suspect, a seven-figure sum. There are engineers, designers, technologists in this room. It's even nicer, I suggest to you, to be given a large eight-figure sum. You've got your maths going. And we set up the Dyson School of Design and Engineering a number of years ago. And you know, what is the Dyson company? The clue here, you know, is it a fast-moving consumer goods company, one goods company? But I would suggest to you that they are just a bunch of experts in very high-speed turbo machinery. Let Daniel reflect upon that one, see whether you agree with it. Anyway, that's the first part of the agenda. Okay, cobotics. I thought I'd better put up a definition. Um, people and robots doing something together, perhaps cooperatively, perhaps towards a common goal. So, yeah, cobotics, that's the subject of today. Okay, I got two or three videos, I'm just going to play them, they tell the story. I might even sit down and watch them with you. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm afraid, well, I, I'm proud to say I could watch that particular video time and time again. I actually have, and I just thoroughly enjoy it, and it epitomises robotics to me. And you know, we got machines, and why not work with them, get the machine to do the dull or the repetitive thing, and get the human to do the interesting thing. And to me, that suggests a way in which we as engineers can design our world. Design involves the transformation of an existing state towards a preferred <coughs> state. I suspect if we were to chat, we, we know that humans spend about, there's a figure, most of us spend about half our time, 40% of us are complaining. Listen to a conversation, it's just what we do. So we know about how to identify problems and challenges. And yet all of us in this room probably have the capacity to be agents of change, to effect change. And so, you know, a philosophy could be to design our, to design machinery in order to make our environment as a society a better place. And no doubt that's what many of you have done in your careers, or will do in your careers. I love Boston Dynamics. I think they are one of the best companies in the world, most exciting, and love their technology. I'm tempted not even to play their video because I'm so jealous. And you will have seen this already. This is the sort of uh, robot uh, attempting to jump and climb and, and falling over and then getting back up. And I've gone up against the Boston Dynamics in competition and delightfully walked away with the IEEE prizes more often than not. And you, know, you, you meet the Boston Dynamics pe people, you know, and make, you know, 100 PhDs from Sussex and uh, Boss, uh, MIT and Harvard, and they're just fantastic and they're great people. And it's really good to pull one over on them when you, you know, you're a bit of the underdog. And um, anyway, um, so they have the, their amazing teams. But it does require a team often, quite often to keep these things operational. And so, yes, you see this and then you, you meet the team of half a dozen or two dozen people behind the scenes keeping it, keeping it operational. And uh, so, amazing technology. And... Uh, uh, It is just fun, just amazing. And, you know, two of them, yeah, just great. And you know, wouldn't you love to have that kind of thing going on in your world? Okay, the data. All right. Uh, again, back to the NHS um, executive in the room. Um, a comment I've been saying a lot over the last six weeks. I was parachuted into a company as emergency CEO or emergency executive chair. And it's been traumatic for everybody. Um, but back to this management and the need to take decisive, incisive decisions. And something I've said throughout the last six weeks is give me pie, not pie chart. And those of you who've been in management meetings, you're forever presented with long reads of data, often by people who are not data savvy. And I just said, after the first few days, I just said, look, I'm a professor. Give me pie. Don't give me pie chart. Uh, don't try and fool me with a long, long report and, and, and data. But you know, through one graphic, you can say a lot. And you know, I, I just thought this was rather good. It's, a, it's two years old, so it's out of date. But um, I, I suspect the numbers aren't that different. But this is, just gives you a, an indication of the number of robot manufacturers by business size. And it just shows you that a lot are small and medium enterprises, or there are a lot of small and medium enterprises in this sector. Is there anything wrong with having a small business? Germany and Austria have, for the last 70 years, excelled in going, we got big, it's nice, let's keep it there with 600 employees and invest back in ourselves and keep it there and keep making profit every year. And I suspect that's an indication of where there's competency going on in terms of personal self-view, ambition, management structure. You know, we got so tempted that you always have to grow, grow, grow. Anyway, a few comments. I'm saying a few provocations. <laughs> there is going to be question time. Um, let's talk a bit about wind. So, I, 
do live here. I live in Hove. I love this view. Half the days I can't see the turbines out at sea. Half the days I can. I can't bear it that the retowering of these um, wind turbines was blocked by the local council. And you, know, you just go, come on. Uh, first time in my life, over the last three years, we, four years, we've had seals in this area, about 20 seals, because there's, there's fish for them because of the wind turbine structures, the trawlers can't get in. Yes, there's lots of fishing going on, but I love the fishing because I can go to the restaurants and get local fish. So the promotion of local sea life due to the presence of these renewables has had a big impact upon this sector. There are five wind farm proposals in the channel. There's only one wind farm in the channel at the moment. Five wind, tar wind farm proposals all being blocked by, by local politicians. Shame upon them. <coughs> okay, wind farms. Um, you can't see this, but this is going on all the time. Um, um, solving this, these fluid flow, yeah, you could probably do it for one turbine with computation fluid dynamics, but um, it's a struggle doing it for a wind farm. And what you're looking at here is applying AI to the scenario and a greedy, greedy per turbine, I want as much as possible each turbine trying to get be as greedy as it can, versus a co cooperative scenario over the placement of these turbines. And it's, it's just good that we in this era have the choice. We can be greedy or we can be cooperative. Again, another pro provocation to each and every person in the room. <coughs> Turbines are great. How do you maintain them? How do you inspect them? How do you repair them? <coughs> Nobody thought about this when they were designing them. And um, it is a challenge. There's a, well, there are eight of them uh, living and working around New Haven. They're called rats. Well, they don't mind being called rats. Rope assisted technicians. So they go out on the boat to the wind turbine, bump up against it, get on, up they go, up the tower. Um, you don't have to climb, you go up the um, hoist lift. Um, get to the top, tether up, a couple of tethers, and out onto the turbine, and sail down. You'd think that everybody would want to do it. Everybody loves rock climbing, but it's, you know, it, it, um, you're on the blade, and those blades move by a few metres. Even the bravest climber, they're, they're like, you know, like rigid position. And if you've been bounced three metres off the blade or eight metres off the blade, are you going to want to go out to work again, ever? There are challenges with this. So, lots of technologies out there. Let's show you some through pictures. Everybody loves quadcopters, or well, we think we do. And um, uh, the technology's moved on a lot over the last two years because of the um, famous wars around the world. Um, when I wanted to buy a 20 kilo heavy lift quadcopter three years ago, I probably couldn't. Now I can buy any number of them for 20 to 60,000 pounds. Um, so, uh, you know, quadcopters are great. And they're great for feeding business to companies like Bladebug because they take photographs, they identify things which might look like a problem, but they can't go on Blade and repair it. They just tell you that there might be a problem. So, uh, uh, yeah, great technology for driving business. At the moment, we use these remote service vessels. You can see the kind of thing here up against the uh, tower. But there are, this is real, um, there are now semi autonomous, quasi autonomous um, remote service vessels for undertaking these tasks. It's dangerous work, frankly. When turbines come in all shapes and sizes, and we are expecting a five-fold increase in wind farms at further distances than we're used to around the United Kingdom. So, um, yeah, why do we have wind, so many wind farms in the channel? Because it's, it's shallow, 20 to 60 metres, so it's easy to get a pile down. Um, the uh, channel is also shallow. Um, but, uh, you know, out in the Irish Sea, um, in the Atlantic, we may well need to go to floating platforms. And there are a few of these now off Scotland and we're gradually discovering 
some of the challenges. And the challenges are that the tower moves and the blades move. And if you're on that as a person, you're going to get really sick. Okay. Um, how do you build these things? I, I just love this bit of technology here. You know, the climbing frame, essentially, to enable you to self-assemble um, your towers. So, you know, engineers are, are busy and out there. This is from Enercom. And then, um, you know, why, do, why are we not building more wind farms? Well, we just don't have enough ships. You know, there is a, um, there are a lot of wind developments around the world, and we just don't actually have enough ships in order to uh, install um, offshore capacity. But there are, you know, people are gradually ordering up things, and it's interesting. Okay, this was meant to be a talk about robotics, but you've seen lots of equipment so far, so let's talk about uh, one specific technology. This, this robot, misleading picture on the left, the CAD, but this is the real robot on the blade. So it's about it is 60 centimetres long. The span, it, it varies according to the gait of the legs, um, but you know, essentially 60, metres, 60 centimetres by 60 centimetres weighs about 20 kilos. And a wind turbine, what are you facing? Well, sometimes it's a concave or a convex surface, and sometimes you want to straddle the leading edge of the trailing edge. Sometimes you want to get inside the blade. The blades are big enough near the hub so you can actually crawl inside it um, easily. You can crawl inside them near the hub. So uh, that's part of the challenge. So this is a, you can see this is a suction robot. Um, so uh, six independent legs with suction, in, the independent suction on each one. There's a lot of redundancy, you can hang off one leg, potentially. Um, show you walking in the moment. So that's one of the challenges. Convex surface, concave surface, you need to be able to hold on, stay on, know where you are. Localization with a robot is a big topic, knowing where the robot is. Knowing where the robot is when the blade is flexing, in more than one plane, puts a real challenge on, on this. Just a little video showing you some of the motion of this room, but we've had fun with this. Oh, it, does, it really does exist. We've got three of them in service at the moment. Um, doing work for all sorts of interesting companies, and this is a, a company that expects to scale this year. Okay, so in the first slide, I showed you a bit of NDT, so, so an ultrasonic scanner, <coughs> and what you're seeing here is that scanner being traversed um, over the surface, um, rep repeated. And this is you know, a hole underneath the surface, so you can't see it with the naked eye, but if you knew it was there, you could probably tap in here, but it's slightly hollow underneath, so you've got two holes and you're being able to see it repeatedly. And if you own the, tur the turbine, or if you're operating it, you might be worried. Some of you will have seen um, videos of turbines breaking mid-span. Some of you have seen uh, turbine fires, wind turbine fires. With inspection, you can avoid this. And that's the rationale behind sending rope assisted technicians onto blades to inspect them, or in this case, sending a robot onto the blade, or three robots and one person. So back to the robotics. Getting the person to investigate the anomalies and the robot to do the boring stuff. And in the case of this robot, what can it do? It can clean. Who wants to clean? Let's face it, who does want to clean? So the robot can sand. Do you want to send your child onto a blade to sand when you know what you know about dust? So the robots can do the boring stuff. 
let the people do the interesting things. <coughs> okay, next case study. How many of you own delightful Sussex homes? Well, I do. And um, uh, if you bang on the floor, is it hollow? You know, does it have an underfloor cavity? So you can see my manufactured an underfloor cavity here and this robot spraying on the other side. Let's talk about this. So we have 12 million of these. We're 6 million terrace homes in the UK. They have a design life of about 600 years. Knock them down, as far as I'm concerned, that's a crime against sustainability. Isn't it great to have a camera in the corner? And um, anyway, so these homes, there is no reason why they should be knocked down, other than they have appalling energy efficiency in the modern context. But of course they were designed for coal. But there's easy solutions. You can insulate the roof with 400 to 500 millimetres of insulation, the latest recommendation. So if you've just got you know, 100 millimetres of, of rock wall, go revisit that, spend next summer um, putting in 500 millimetres. It makes a big difference. Redo your seals on your windows. Doesn't matter if you've got sash windows, not double glazed, just redo the seals. You don't need to spend £30,000 on retrofitted double glazing or even more, £60,000. Um, consider solar. If you've got loads of money, go for a heat pump. Um, but another solution you could do is tackle the floor, which is 15% of the energy loss. And recognise this. Uh, both Alex in the back row and myself uh, lived in these houses and uh, loved it there. You know, terrace houses can be delightful. They can be objects of desire. And they can even be valuable. And they have amazing construction. You know, why do we build with cavity floors? You know, it's because we build on hills and because of heave. So our ground gets wet, dries out. You know, four seasons in the UK. And um, there's a lot of movement, 30 to 60 millimetres of movement <coughs> of the home. So you need to be able to allow for that through your construction archetype. Another video. I'm Danny Cavell and I'm the robot manager here at QBot. Here at QBot, we build robots for the construction industry. This here is Annie. Annie and her other robotic friends are used to apply underfloor insulation to suspended timber floors. A team of installers will arrive at your property, they will get out the spray equipment, they will then make an access hatch within the property, they will attach the spray equipment to Annie and stir her into the void. She will then survey the area and then we will go through and perform the insulation. We then measure the depth and thickness of the insulation to ensure job well done. A lot of energy is wasted in the UK by heating old, poorly insulated properties. If we insulate the 8 million properties within the UK with suspended timber floors, it's the equivalent CO2 savings of shutting off two power stations. At the moment, Cuba is working with local authorities and housing associations. So, people running the robots, the robots doing the, the nasty stuff, spraying two part material in a space you wouldn't want to send any human being, no matter where they're from. <coughs> and I think this is an example of cobotics. Cubot now employs 60 people, 55 robots in the field, and um, Many installations have been done in Brighton and Hove and the Sussex area. I've got two more slides. Good? Well, you want yeah. to stop me now? No, no. Okay, one is on competency. And a few comments. You know, um, on robots. People have heard about digital twins, but anybody who's run a robot will have gone, well, the robot is had to have a digital twin 50 years ago in order to make it walk. You need that digital model in order to control your equipment. You know, we've got the IET here today, we've got the ADSC here today. So a lot of competencies in digital modeling and digital twinning. So some of these topics are just old. With feature recognition, 
you need AI to drive feature recognition. So anybody being in, involved in robotics has been doing AI and digital twins for a very long time. And with some of those challenges I've shown you today about localization, you know, knowing where you are in a changing environment, well, you need advanced AI approaches in order to figure that all out. So, lots on AI. Um, regulation. Many of you will be concerned. Do you want our equipment run and controlled by something you cannot determine? You cannot apply to de deterministic approaches to. You don't even know what the code is. And that is a challenge. So, you know, regulation is going to be, or is an important part of this profession. But therein is also a challenge. You know, uh, and I've suggested to um, political leaders recently that perhaps we need AI tools to regulate the AI tools and approaches. So there's an interesting concept for you. Education. So you know, I, I benefited from being educated in the Brighton Hove area and Sussex area, and hugely, and I've stayed here, and love that approach. But I am working with two super, super teachers, definition of super teacher, somebody with a million people in her class. And that has been fascinating to see the reach and the use of tools to enable one million people to receive bespoke, individualised education suited to their individual differences. What well, is changing very quickly, very fast. And in the robotic sector and the AI sector, where do we learn? Do we learn from aged professors who code at a twentieth of the speed of her or him in the back room? Or do you learn off YouTube and off massive online open courses? You can see all right, so a few provocations. Last slide. Couldn't resist this. I wanted to take a picture of the, um, uh, at the, um, uh, just off the home seafront that I did. And then just this provocation, you can read it for yourself. And uh, there I shall close. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your attention. Um, I, did, I didn't understand. <coughs> excuse me. I didn't understand the slide about um, <coughs> the turbines being greedy or collaborative. Okay. So, um, do you orientate a turbine? So you can feather the blades and orientate the, the turbine to 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 wind, mm -hmm. and each tur turbine uniquely, well, uniquely is uniquely positioned to, to um, want a particular quantity of wind. And, but by <coughs> one turbine being greedy, then one further downstream may not get as much. And so it's, it's, it's a question of organizing all 60 or 100 so that um, a, a better overall outcome, the cooperative outcome. I just didn't explain myself well. What is that? Hello. Well, do, you, do you still call that cobotics? Because surely that's just sort of software yeah, organization, okay. isn't it? It depends. There's no robots. robots isn't it? Well, okay. What do you call a robot? Well, it's something that does Okay. <laughs> but not all robots. I mean, not all robots have arms. So, in the case of the cubot robot, it's it's a wheeled robot with spray. So it has no arms. In the case of the blade bug, it has six pedipalators, but no. Um, and the, um, the robot chassis, in the case of Bladebug, is empty. And it's the chassis that is the end effector. So the chassis is a bit like the machine tool head. And you can place inside that empty box anything you like. And so, um, yes, I mean, I have great fun with what is a machine, what is a robot. Um, and you know, in the case of... In the, Okay, we're at the IET. Biggest machine in the world? LHC. LHC. What do you think? Go on, tell us. A large hadron collider at the point of the sun. Okay, good. Okay, let's have some more. Biggest machine in the world? 
<laughs> Great. So is the internet bigger than the LEC? Is the internet machine? It's any measure. Any more? Uh, quantum computers. Okay. Quantum computing. There'll be some more. I mean, I, you know, all of these answers will be correct in their own way, won't they? Some people have suggested it's the grid. The electrical, you know, the supply of electrical energy around the world. Because you know, when we connected up to France and then the US connected up to Canada and Mexico, um, we're yet to have a trans-Pacific, yeah, but we do have transatlantic connecting, but not for power. Huh? Okay. Okay. Um, so, you know, what is a machine? What's a robot? I, I'm, I can give you definitions, but I can also give you contrary definitions. We had another question here. Yes, the, the, the question was in relation to the, the, the lovely picture you, uh, movie that you showed right at the beginning of a, an operator working. At, it, I, I would have called that true um, uh, cobotics because it was a human being yeah. and the machine yes. working together all the time. Yes. Now my question is, are there any particular special, uh, you talked about regulation, but uh, health and safety issues, are, are there ones, when, when you put the two together, which, which need addressing? So a lot of us probably have learnt our robotics near a KUKA robot, and you wouldn't put a person anywhere near <laughs> some of those old-fashioned KUKA industrial robots, because they just won't stop. But um, with robotic robot, robotry, um, you tend to use um, motors which will not drive continuously through. You'll use control mechanisms that when they discover some resistance will be more compliant. So it's right down at the basic level. Of That's right. So you want, you want something that you could stop the motion of. Okay. And that needs to be a deliberate design decision. Yeah. I'm sure you get it. You? Yeah, just to add to that, uh, it's like the secu uh, safety systems in industrial automation. They were considered in the design. Uh, my question is, thanks for the talk, first of all, but my question is around uh, Tesla Optimus. I'd like to know what your view is on what they're offering, what they are saying is going to come, the timelines. And you, you had stuff up there about AI and regulation, and I know all that stuff's going to get in the way for them. But, but they're being um, okay. very... Well, to, actually, why, I, I would love to hear your view, and then I will give you a response. Do you want to tell people what what they're up to? Uh, yeah, so they, uh, Tesla have a robot that they have developed that uh, they've shown they've shown it so far um, <clears throat> cutting vegetables and, and making a recipe of something. It can walk around, um, and they want to sell it as a, a home helper for somebody that would technically, eventually do the cleaning, probably do your clothes and everything for you. Um, but Thank is, you, is, is there a bunch of PhDs behind it? So yes, um, yeah. so, uh, so I've met a lot of humanoids, um, gynoids and androids. You know, we know what an android is, gynoids exist as well. And um, uh, so you know, humanoid robots, um, people can't resist it. So you know, Blade Runner was, as a film, was it 40 years ago? And uh, you know, got a lot of people thinking. And I suppose I grew up reading 1950s science fiction, and I just loved it. It was written in the 1930s because of the Second World War. It didn't come out to the 1950s. So we had that kind of thinking for a long time. And there are a lot of teams pushing forward humanoids. There's teams in Italy, teams in, in South Korea, team, many teams in China, teams in Sweden, teams in, uh, across America. Um, and there are many applications for these things. I, I've said cleaning. Well, yeah, you know, cleaning robots. Uh, ones which would keep our public toilets clean would be great, wouldn't it? Mm. Um, and um, so I, I think we can think of a lot of applications. Here in the United Kingdom, we have a loneliness challenge. We have a care challenge. And as a society, we haven't tackled that in the modern era. And uh, yeah, unless you're wealthy, you can't, you can't get, you, you can't readily get access to good care. So you can't um, 
so there are many challenges, and so the Optimus technology, yeah, you know, there'll be so many views on Tesla, but you know, I just stand back and go, wow, yeah. most of the time. Um, uh, and the same with Boston Dynamics, I stand back and go, wow. Actually, I just step forward and want to get into it and have a look and play around. Um, so I've talked with a humanoid. I've shaken hands. I've, if I could dance, I would have danced. Um, and so these technologies have been around for a while and they're just getting better and better. One of the issues will be, do you want to emulate the human completely? And some teams do. And other teams are recognising that actually, if you make it slightly bigger, that's more interesting. It's also a bit scary. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're, you're made for doing, um, you know, doing DIY. Well, actually, having an eight-foot robot is actually more handy than having one that's the same as you. I shouldn't have said eight foot. It's about <laughs> eight <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. I, I do have. Oh, so, follow up. I'm sorry, David. Sorry. I, I do have one opinion. Um, it seems like a very brave thing to try and um, push all of that technology into a humanoid straight away. Um, do you think it'd be better to to have some smaller? Uh, I've, I've seen these uh, cooking robots, which are just arms. They're static. Um, same for uh, okay. cleaning clothes and so on. Um, in the UK, we've got one of the most impressive, or we've got a number of the most impressive robots, I think, in the world, which is the Akavio robot. They're 600 metres by 600 metres by 45 metres high, um, operating with you know, 60 to 300 people inside it, supplying our, our groceries. Absolutely amazing technology. And so, you know, that makes sense. It doesn't look like a human. But it's doing what you know, doing grocery shopping, and um, I, I think it's a design decision. You, know, what do you actually want as a team? And some teams are going to want to do humanoids that look like look interesting, um, each with a different wig, and some are going to want to do. Uh, so, Krishna uh, Nakayara at Imperial, he does robotic organs. But he's not doing them to clean blood or clean air. He's doing them um, for calibrating clinicians so that when you push on the torso, you, you dial in the body mass index and the gender and, and, and age. And um, then you push upon the organ and go, healthy kidney, unhealthy, you know, un unhealthy kidney. Um, and to me, uh, he's also done ones for the face to look at grimaces um, so that... Um, the clinician again can see what kind of grimace you expect when you push on a tender appendix. Um, yeah. Uh, so there you go. Uh, I, I read just this week about auto manufacturers, I think it was Mercedes and BMW in particular, who are building cooperative robots that are human scale. And that was based on the fact that. Uh, the, their production lines are designed for humans, yes. and so all the spaces are yeah. for humans. And, and so getting, it, getting into, into, a, into a frame yes. uh, makes yeah. sense. Mm. Yes. Uh, in those particular companies, they're going to need to work extremely fast in order to remain competitive, aren't they? Mm. Um, you know, worldwide competition is what it is, and uh, you know, are they in time? Hello. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, and you wouldn't send a person into some of these large colliders, would you? Whereas you would send a pneumatic robot in. Yeah. Um, you can't send a trunks into some, some of these, some of these um, highly irradiated environments, but you can send in robots with all their actuation done through pneumatics. So, um, with the sort of acceleration of uh, text prompt AIs that we're using now, um, it seems to me that it's inevitable that we're going to have text or voice prompt machines. Or brain machine interface. Yeah, exactly. Um, where we can ask the machine whether it be DIY or leisure or transport or whatever you want um, to do a type of specific task. For you. How do you, I mean, we've all seen really funny photos that, you know, the, that art generation by AI comes out with the creatures. Mm -hmm. How on earth do you start regulating for these machines, so you say you can't even see what it's thinking, and 
knowing that you can go to the line of decision. I've been doing decision making software for a while and we lost control with some of our decision making software a while back. I could say to you, don't answer this is rhetorical, but I could say to you, you know, are you an emotional thinker or are you a rational thinker? And then I could examine your IQ. And something we know about people with good IQ is that they are they tend to take gut reaction and do post decision rationale. So you, you know, I suspect everybody in this room takes their decisions within five milliseconds far too fast for that for what they for what they, they claim they're going to do. They claim they do. Um, but because you're clever, you've then got a few seconds to justify to your partner why you did what you did. <laughs> um, Okay, I'm just saying that because um, we humans gate a lot of things. And we tend to claim that we gate things with rationale. And I think that rationale can have a place, even with advanced generative AI tools. And you can test that. And, but I suspect that the only, the only mechanism we're going to have to control AI is going to be AI itself. But um, we are moving very fast, and so people are blending software philosophies. So you're not just got to cope with AI, you've got to cope with those wonderful um, developments out of computer science, so, and here from Sussex, actually, you know, Maggie Bowden, stuff that she wrote in her books in the 1980s, people are now able to implement in coding and then blend that with AI. So um, I, I think that it's, it's more of a minefield than the proponents or opponents of AI are suggesting. And it's moving far faster. We haven't had any questions in the back row, have we? <laughs> well, let's give the, give the back row an opportunity. Is there a question from the back row? <coughs> we'll come to yours. Have you got time? Yes, yeah. yeah. No? Yeah, back row question, not back row question. It's, it's, question. Like it's for a statement. Um, oh, great. I, I insulated the crawl space under my house last winter, and I really enjoyed doing it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I don't see a robot doing it. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I'm straight. That's fine. <laughs> and has it improved the comfort of your home? Uh, very much so, yeah. Brilliant. So no drafts. You should have sent a small child. <laughs> 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 I couldn't send my son down, but I did try. I had thought about your video, if I may, which was about watching the lady assemble the uh, differential. And you said that the, the robot did do things and the humans did the differential. It struck me that what the robot was doing was the delicate operation of not being able to vary by taking the heavy parts and putting it into the very uh, assembly in a very controllable way, the sophisticated part of the life. Yep. And the lady was doing the simple part, which was my Would you dare to say that to the operator? Um. <laughs> <laughs> the robot's not going to get tired, and she might. Yeah, okay. um, however, the operator may also be able to pick up upon anomalies and be the supervisor. And turn it off. Yeah. Okay, fair point. Fair point's well made. I mean, that, my question is actually following on from that. I was <coughs> thinking about this, where you have a, a human and a robotic tool. You know, I think that's mm. you know, not a, not a, a, a human robot, but actually a tool that's focused on a certain job, whether it be your roofing, on the floor, or whatever. How do we see the skill set of the person controlling it? Because I assume they can't be <coughs> trained up to be able to understand the robotics. That's that's far too big a leap, and actually, a lot of that will be done by someone talking to technology to do that. To start right. But how do we get the, the balance right such so we don't get the public saying these are taking our jobs from saying this is actually providing a better skilled job? And you can think like the underground where the trains can drive themselves themselves, but the staff say, No, I must drive the train because I'm there for an emergency. Well, actually, a robot that can go out on the live rail is actually far more useful than a human that has to sit there. And, and how do we get that change? How do we get the public to accept that we can change to this by working? Two different things there. I will, I will give answers. I'll give responses, probably not answers. 
Um, what training do you need to work with technology? Well, I would suggest that um, your teenage children have done a lot of it playing computer games. A lot of it. And that enables you to accept a lot of these technologies very quickly, very easily, and to be great at prompt coding. Um, 20 years ago, I stopped coding. Two years ago, I started again because of prompt coding. And so um, yeah, I was able to give instructions and then get back code better than I ever learned. And, um, and look at it and go, cool, that's a good structure. And um, being able to implement it. So writing scripts to go from one software to another is just delightful now because you just ask the prompt to do it for you. Look at it and go, yeah, that, that looks good, have a go. And it's doing the job for you. I found that um, last time my efficiency was measured, productivity was measured, was 2017. I'm eight times more productive than I was in 2017. You know, the world of academia has changed. You can get reports written for you, presentations written for you. Um, uh, you can teach large audiences and engage with them in an individualised manner um, at scale using live streaming and the AI tools and um, personalised assessment tools. So it's not a moving society on. Well, that's always that's always been a challenge throughout history. Um, I've, I visit China regularly, and you know, the wealth of China is immense. I, I tend to say that they're the wealthiest country I know on earth. And um, uh, a couple of the uh, motor manufacturers mentioned earlier have been visiting China and are shocked at how many years in advance they are. And they go, you know, what happened? How come we're five years behind? And um, uh, so. Things just change, whether you like it or not. And you, if you stay where you are, you may then discover a new system which has been on the innovation curve and is just 25 years ahead of you. Yeah, I think it's the, the challenge is how do we get people to accept it? And, I, and you touched on prompt writing. I was talking to you earlier about my son starting in the States. is about software that allows an idiot to write the prompts much better. So you actually get very sensible mm -hmm. stuff out, and that's the stuff he's running. But he's saying the majority of coders won't exist in five years. And I'm going, you know, they're dental ropes. He said, no, there won't be a job as a coder in about five years because they'll have gone because the systems are getting so good they will replace. So the and you can talk to the system. The Caltech and it. Harvard curriculums are very different to the old-fashioned British curriculums in, in in some of the technology areas represented here today they are doing courses in serendipity. <laughs> and um, I teach multidisciplinarity. Um, so I think that there needs to be a sea change. It doesn't, you know, <coughs> yeah, I'll stop before uh, some of the um, academics in the room reach me. I think that, that <laughs> bit about the change is there. He says, well, we'll have to have it, you know, you'll get an automatic wage from the government, you'll have to, because there won't be jobs. And I'm going, you know, it's never happened with technology, it's always created more work. Yeah. Um, it will just be different work. And actually it needs to, to make people satisfied. Well, I think robotics provides a, a philosophy and a choice <coughs> by which it could be collaborative. Mm. Um, with the Cubot robot, we did have a totally autonomous robot four or five years ago, and we stepped back from that because we realised there were benefits of actually going collaborative. Daniel, you had a question, didn't you? My, yeah. my host had a question. <coughs> uh, we touched briefly on, I guess, control of AI, or AI, AI to monitor AI. Um, but it seems to me, certainly in the short term, Misuse of technology by humans is a far more likely scenario than a losing control of AI itself. Um, so I guess. What do you call misuse of technology? Uh, well, you mentioned drones in your talk. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say that's a huge misuse of drones. Sorry. Uh, you mentioned drones earlier and the acceleration, the availability of drones. Yes. Uh, for quite sad reasons. Okay. 
Um, so I guess my question is, are we focusing too much on AI itself and that kind of human impulse to say technology is going to take us over? It seems to me far more likely that a human is going to use a technology for a nefarious use. And how do you how do you prevent that or control that or legislate that? I don't think you can. I suspect you're right. We with ourselves, we so often do what we don't want to do as an individual. St. Paul said that 2,000 years ago, didn't he? Uh, so with our own you know, um, self-will, we sometimes can't even control ourselves. And um, anyway, I'm going to go to a... You know, do you personally have a pessimistic view about the future, an optimistic view, or a realistic view? And I suspect that you're going to a bit of the realistic view, that there will be misuse and use. Um, sometimes I've been accused of an abuse of power. And I've retorted, saying, no, it wasn't an abuse of power, it was use of power. And I, this is a man, yeah, going back to that conversation about management, sometimes you will take a management decision. Not everybody will like it, but you believe that it's informed and for the better good. I would say that's use of power. So, use of AI, yes, can occur, and abuse of AI for not so good rationales can occur, and is going to occur. Um, when your tumour is identified by machine learning, one of the developments of artificial intelligence, for, for yourself or your loved one, you will be so pleased that AI exists. So there's a thought. Should we stop there? Uh, I tell you what, should we take one more? Just to okay. in, in. <coughs> Who's it going to be? Yes. Yes, go. Hello, again. Uh, hello, yes, okay. Do you see the military as big future users of robotics? I don't want to answer that. Well, <laughs> first of all, but forget shooting people for a minute, but uh, minefield clearance and bomb disposal things wouldn't be wonderful. Well, we already have it for bombs. Okay, let's let's do something different. I'm not going to answer that question. Tell me. Um, but um, weeding, weeding your garden. Um, so uh, you'll love your garden. I love. Yeah, I'm in the middle age. I like my garden. Um, uh, you, there are you know, definition of a weed. You know, uh, a plant, a plant in a place that you don't want to. It's still a plant. Um, <laughs> but you know, could could there be a collaborative assistant that does some of the some of the things you don't want to do or are no longer able to do because you're 58 years old or whatever and distance my shoes seems to get longer and further and further each day. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm talking about much the same application. Um, you know, things that you don't things that you don't want in the wrong place or things that are poisonous in the wrong place. Um, things that are you know, um, things so being able to find them, being able to destroy them or lose them, um, uh, repurpose them, I believe that's absolutely something that robots can do. Alright, well thank you very much Peter, it's been uh, an excellent talk, I very much enjoyed it. Thank um, you for the invitation. Yeah. Thank you.